Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business Radio, the show about ways to stay competitive in a changing market, break through business plateaus, and respond to the changing expectations of today's customers. Your host, Jess Duell, is a rapid growth entrepreneur, consultant, and business advocate with a 20-year track record of business excellence. She candidly discusses how to achieve your growth strategy and realize your company's unfulfilled potential. Now, here's Jess. You're in the right place for conversations about current needs that we as business leaders face regarding technology, customer expectations, and quickly changing markets. This is program 211, sustainability as a leadership value. And when we think about sustainability, there are a lot of different ways to go. So we're going to talk about the qualities of sustainability today and only pick a few out to talk about that give us the most impact, the most opportunity, and really counterintuitively, the most time and space to really grapple with what we're working to grapple with and achieve for our employees, for ourselves, for our companies, for our communities, and for the world in a way that delivers our mission in this new and changing marketplace. Dr. Federico Fioretto is an entrepreneur, a trainer, a coach, and he's incredibly passionate about sustainability, specifically around the development of human potential within organizations. He believes in the possibility to transform all conflicts and provide a method to communicate in a way that realizes more potential than we thought possible. How you doing, Federico? I'm doing great and even better when I'm with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you. I always like when we talk because we're in two different time zones. I'm all, the morning is when I'm the most energetic and the evening is when I'm not as energetic and it's, you know, five o'clock where you are. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good combination. That's a very good time for me, this last part of the afternoon. So we are both in the best place and time. Isn't it amazing how things come together exactly the way that they ought to? Yeah, that's a logic in life. Yes, provided we're open to it. That's actually where I wanted to start is with this concept of, you know, shared knowledge. If I kept everything in my head and you kept everything in your head, we don't actually have the ability to know what each other knows in a way that we could build off of each other's experience. Is that your finding as well? We start from anthropology in a way because yes, we humans are a social species. And therefore, we are made for sharing knowledge and experience. And from knowledge and experience of others, we learn and we improve and we add to each other's ideas, creativity, and capacity to resolve problems. So maybe the first quality of sustainability that you are very competently pulling out is the, the quality of connecting, because you cannot do sustainability alone. It's the basis of sustainability is getting people together and getting the famous stakeholders, very well misunderstood sometimes, acting together and transforming uh, apparent conflict into more opportunities to solve each other's problems together. So that's the first quality that I see. So when we share knowledge, we have to overcome some ego sometimes. We have to overcome the ego of somebody else who might feel like we're stepping on their toes, trying to get to the information within their head to use nefariously, right? To, to take advantage of them. And so we have to overcome our own and other people's um, past experience with communication. We all have triggers, right? Things that go, wow, well, wait, I'm not gonna tell you anymore. <laughs> and other times it's like, what are you doing here? What's this all about? This seems weird. And so when we find ourselves in that situation, knowing that a quality of sustainability is to get out of that, to increase our own personal awareness, but to also meet other people where they are, how would you suggest we start that process when we find ourselves in the middle of a landmine we didn't know existed? Well, these landmines is a very appropriate expression, but that's a delusion. There are no landmines of this kind, but they are only made up by our fears. And as you mentioned, from some past experiences, but actually 
if I stick to my ego and I want to keep my personal and individual knowledge and capacity very well behind a screen or within a fortress, in reality, what I'm making, I'm making myself poorer because uh, it's much more valuable to share my information and concentrating my energy on generating new knowledge, new ideas, new solutions, than to try to protect what I have achieved in the past and, and remaining stuck there. I don't know if you are aware, for instance, of the decision of Tesla to share the um, knowledge and the technologies open source. It's something I've seen in some other companies. For instance, I have a client that in Italy, it's a pharmaceutical company in, in the homeopathic uh, field. And they have this policy of free patents of their remedies and molecules and formulas. Basic idea is more costly to protect past knowledge than it is to develop new knowledge and being a front runner. And in fact, this, this shares the benefits of one's knowledge and creativity. And what I, we have seen from getting back to Tesla, I think it's General Motors, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's a big company that's building the first electric pickup truck, 100% electric, using Tesla's technology. And that's doing good for this company who is developing a new uh, pickup truck for the environment. It's generating value, jobs, uh, profits, uh, benefits for all. We cannot say Tesla isn't a company that's generating new knowledge and new technology. So they don't stick there, but they are more open to that. I'm putting something out there so other people can build on it. Good luck, have fun. And mm -hmm. that's one way that companies and individuals can do that. They can contribute to this larger community. And I'm thinking about within an organization that is for profit, that must make profit to, you know, satisfy shareholder requirements, continue to be able to employ the people that they employ, continue to be a part of the community that they have chosen to be a part of. And now I'm thinking about, let's say you and I were on the same team. And with you and I being on the same team, and we were both brought in for our expertise, we have to figure out how to work together. We have to figure out what knowledge I have and what knowledge you have that we can bring to share in this more closed environment, yet still as powerful environment to create something new for intellectual property, for development of a program or a process within a for-profit organization as well. I mean, it, we can bring it down into the ecosystem of a company. Knowledge is just a small part of that. We know each other a little bit. And I've come to sustainability through years of development of communication methodologies for the transformation of conflicts. And in fact, what I have learned is that when people clash, usually it's a personality or ego clash or fear that belongs to the ego, by the way. But the fact is people lose sight of the objects their own objects and the common objects. In this example you made, we are together part of the same team and we have to learn how to work together. But why are we in the same team? Well, certainly we have common objects, but when we don't think about the advantage of co-creating new and more interesting realities, we lose sight of the common object that has taken us together and the delusional object becomes prevailing upon you. And that wastes completely the energy. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of energy, and by the way, we miss the most important object that was the one that put us together. What kind of value are we here to generate? And then it's a bigger object. Then, of course, we have to respect the fact that we have individual objectives and that we also have to respect them. And also I've built on the shoulders of many more researchers and thinkers that by definition, the real human needs cannot be in conflict with one another. It's just the ego that can be in, in conflict with the others. It's very easy to go along well when we stick to the basics and we think about our common goals and common objects.
I don't know if you are talking sustainability, but we are talking certainly a smart way to run organization. Yeah, and it's an element of when we have strong-willed, uh, results-driven, and even innovative and visionary people, the way they do themselves can be so different, right? The way you do you and the way you do me, we, unless, and this is where, where I'm going with this, is that having teams with odd numbers is always a good thing. I mean, it's good in design, it's good in people, because there can never be a tie. There's always going to be something that tips the balance toward the greater good for the whole when there's an odd number. And I'm thinking about organizations that are high impact. They want to create these cascading effects throughout not only their community and their stakeholders, but for the world, like what you were talking about with the Tesla example. When there's an even number, we tend to go, well, I'm right. And the other person goes, I'm right. And there's nobody there to tell them, you're both right. So let's look at that from what filters do we want to look at that from to unleash our possibility? In a way, I think we can go a step forward. We can do that through education. If people were educated to communication and competent way of dealing with conflicts of this kind, it would be no more a question of odd or even, because it's not a matter of right or wrong. So you completely skip that and you just put on the table honestly and transparently your goals and your needs. And no one is trying to prevail upon the other, but we are both trying to reach a win-win solution, which is the needs of every one of us are satisfied, including the saving face or respecting oneself, you know, dignity and all that kind of stuff. No one gets humiliated because they haven't been right. And even if you have odd numbers, you might have a situation when the loser or the minority is humiliated if the others are not dealing appropriately with the conflict. It can become a struggle of force. So it's important that people get educated in thinking that we are all there in order to solve the problems that we have and that we share in, in one way or in another. For instance, talking about sustainability and the impact of, of human activity on the planet and, and on the, the ecosystem that's our life support. The fact is we are using 1.7 planets a year. So that's a common problem that we have. How could we possibly fight over that? Oh, I hear you. Well, and I have a perfect example in a tiny microcosm of a company. <laughs> My first company, really, my husband and I both were involved in it and it was successful in spite of us because he had his way of doing things and what he put priority on. I had my way of doing things and what I had put my priority on and they always seemed at odds. So we were always at odds, even though we always got to the end goal. So the road was really bumpy. And then of course, the illustration of this example, right? The 21-year-old Jessica, the more we're able to become aware, the more we can recognize how much more information is available to us, not only from the person sitting across from us, while we have the same end goal, we have really different ways of doing it, and we can argue and fight and have dissonance along the way, or we can redefine the problem we're trying to solve. That's what I heard you say, together. Exactly. So you had very well in mind the fact that you had common goals mm -hmm. and you respected the fact that the other person had a different way of doing things, but, but that's something that's a value for the company because if you have a series of clones, uh, they could be able to solve only certain type of problems. That's, that's why diversity is so important. Did I just hear you mention AI? Uh, no. <laughs> My brain went there. <laughs> uh, maybe. Or maybe because I have commented a post of yours today about AI. Yes. So maybe you have that in mind. That's true. And I did I, see that this morning. <laughs> uh, and I perfectly agreed with your consideration. There's too much emphasis today on AI, which is a wonderful thing, but we are underestimating human intelligence.
And we are underinvesting on human intelligence, which is amazing. Isn't it interesting? Because I think, well, like, okay, so like sustainability, right? There are all of these different ways that AI can actually help us. They can free up the things that have become, I call it maybe a commodity, like answering certain kind of emails. When you copy and paste from an email draft because you're answering the same email with the same answer 25 or 50 times a day, you make the shortcut. Well, it makes sense that we would want our technology that's already allowed us to make 50 of those connections in a day more efficient because then what gets to happen? We have more time to do other things. We have more time to be creative. We have more time to add to this greater good and create value in the way that you're describing. And at the same point in time, we have people going, we have so much technology. We're so disconnected. Maybe we ought to use technology to have that connection. It's a whole other interesting concept of the spectrum. And who knows where any of that's going to be. I have no predictions one way or the other. I have no feelings one way or the other. I am just in a place of curiosity and awe and sometimes a lot of scared <laughs> because this pendulum swings both ways before it finds the equilibrium, doesn't it? I'm so much open to artificial intelligence that one of the next steps of our Embedded Sustainability Index is going to be the development of an artificial intelligence solution for something that today, since we are a very young startup and we are trying, doing everything with very few hands, we are still doing that manually. So we incorporate the materiality of a single company into a common and shareable benchmark. So it's, it's very complex what we have developed. And of course, it would be very welcome to use artificial intelligence to do that thing is something very stupid. It's just the fact of incorporating a lot of information into a fine tuning of a tool. So that's wonderful. But I had a discussion with an AI expert one day, he was a former client of mine, and they met him on, on a train. So we were together for two hours. And we had this discussion, and finally he had to admit that artificial intelligence cannot imagine a future that's different from what it knows today or from the past, meaning that it cannot be visionary. Interesting. So we should develop human intelligence through education, culture, stimuli to, to young people and to everyone in order to develop the visionary capacity of the human being and then have machine and artificial intelligence do all just stupid things that fill up our days. Some people talk about AI, other people talk about big data and how we gather the information, how we put it all together, the way that it gets crunched, the way that we're looking at the results could be all of those things can have some sort of automation involved. So defining what our human potential is, the value that we're bringing, the way that our brains work is very interesting. I'm thinking about 12 year olds. I'm thinking about... 15 year olds and what they've been learning in school up to this point and what they're going to continue to learn in school as they go forward. How do you feel about the way schooling is happening today in terms of preparing the generations that are following us for this more visionary role in the world? Very badly, except with few exceptions. For instance, in Europe, there is Finland, who is running very, very interesting experiments in education that's giving more room to the development of the brain and of the creative capacity of the child. It's funny because I have a member of my family following an educational program on pedagogy and education and training. We have innovation masters in education from the 19th century that have put together approaches and methodologies to education that are very effective in unleashing this creative capacity of the child that is necessary for the visionary man and woman of the future that have been completely overlooked and are being talked about and recovered just now as if they were the innovators. So the knowledge and the capacity to, to develop that is there since 150 years. And there's a lot that has to be changed. What I have to say, but I don't know 
uh, the U.S. education so much. I know it marginally, and I think it's, it's very specific, and it doesn't give a lot of education outside the specific line of training, but that's a general impression. Training is a good word. In general, it may be an extrapolation, so anybody listening who takes issue with me saying that, just hear it out. Our system was set up to train. Our system was set up to do a certain thing. And even though our times have changed, that system has not changed and we are still producing the same output. It's a good system. Look how long it lasted. <laughs> That's what I have to say. <laughs> I think you have, you have put it greatly. Um, and that's because you are more familiar with the language that then the training is, is the problem. So... Yes, <laughs> we have to switch from training our kids to helping them create and think and innovate. Yes. And in fact, if you think about the word, the very word education, it comes from Latin, and it means to pull out from the person. So it means to pull out what there's in. And it, and it talks about the splendid potential of the human being. So we have to help kids and grown-ups too. Us too. Agreed. Pull up out more, more and more. That's what I mean when I, even in my conferences and public speeches, I'm, sometimes I'm pretty adamant about this. The problem with AI is that we are investing too much in that and neglecting to invest in human intelligence. And that's exactly the point you are making. We should invest more in education. And then it's very well to invest in AI. But if we could invest, I would say, 20% in human intelligence of what we are investing in artificial intelligence, that would make a great deal of difference. You are listening to The Voice of Bold Business Radio. In every program, we share stories, tips, and concepts that benefit short-term goals and increase confidence in long-term positioning. Stay current and receive programs to continue sparking ideas about growth strategy by subscribing to the program at voiceofboldbusiness.com. Now, back to Jess. You're listening to Program 211, Sustainability, which is a leadership value. I'm Jess Duell, growth entrepreneur, and today talking with me is Dr. Federico Fioretto, entrepreneur, trainer, and coach, who is so focused on sustainability every single time we talk, we never know where we're going to go, but we come back to this concept of this idea of how does it create value? How does that ripple out to beyond just us? Federico, this is kind of interesting because there's a phrase that I have started to throw around that I'm, kind of, I'm not quite ready to claim as my own but I guess I already have because I talk about it. And it's called dimensional leadership. And I think having dimensionality of some sort is a quality of sustainability. Would you agree? Wow, I should understand a bit more of what is your meaning of dimensional. So just me, right? If it's just me and I'm thinking and I'm doing my deep work and I'm creating, it's to the power of me. When I bring you in and I share my thinking, and you're bringing your experience and your wisdom and the diversity of everything that you know, and I'm coming to you because of the positive intention, you will add constructively, and even if I react a little bristly, I know it's with the best intention. Now we're the power of two. So it's the concept or the idea or the energy squared. Now let's add a person from our audience. Now we're to the third power. Let's add a fourth person to the fourth power and on and on and on when we are willing to harness that awareness. In this meaning, absolutely. Because you cannot do sustainability alone. And, and we can say this about a person, about a family, about a company, or about an industrial system, about an economy, and about the planet. But throughout all these dimensions, we have to build relationships, exchange knowledge, information, a lot of understanding and reciprocal empathy, because we are different. And sometimes, as you said, we react in ways that... <laughs> Sometimes scared. Yeah, know? right. And I think bristly comes from scared. Why didn't I think of that? Or yeah. is he really right? Or 
am I really stupid that I didn't see that? I mean, you know what I mean? And, and those are those things that we're conditioned within our peer groups to wonder about now and again. But I will give you an example of how caring about apparently someone else gives an advantage and generates value for a subject. Uh, there's a company in the Netherlands, it's Daiku, I think it's called, or CO2, whatever. And they are in the dyeing industry. Dyeing of clothes is very polluting, and it generates a lot of waste, a water that has to be treated. So it's a very, very unsustainable process uh, originally, mm -hmm. right? right? So caring about sustainability has taken this company to generate an extraordinary innovation, and they now don't use water at all into this process, but they use high pressure CO2 as a solvent of the dye. So this makes that 98% of the dye that they use is absorbed by the yarn. And they don't have, of course, as I mentioned, any wastewater, so they don't have any cost of, of wastewater, of buying the water, treating it, discharging it. And by the way, since there is no drying process, the process takes 50% time less. So by caring of the environment and trying to be sustainable, they're making good business. But of course, they haven't developed this innovation by themselves alone. They have been working with companies that deal with gases, they need to get the CO2 treated and compressed in, in the right way. Maybe they had to deal with the university research center in order to know something more, develop experiments, etc. So it's adding pieces, connections. So it's a multi-dimensional thing, as well as circular economy. And this is another example that I use in my conferences. The passage is not too linear to circular. That's not enough. You have to make the passes to linear, to circular, to multidimensional. Otherwise, circular is, is too little. In fact, the ecosystem is not circular. It's, at least it's a spiral. And as you know, a spiral is a circle that goes through multiple dimensions. So maybe I agree with your dimensions. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. It's too soon to tell. Jury is out. Well, so there you go. I just took something out of a vacuum. I put it right out here in our conversation. And we have more information. And we're going to keep building that idea. That's what that comes to. And that's where we're generating value in a way that we can have new organizational structures that can foster innovation. And different communication structures. We have different kinds of leadership. So, for instance, we are hearing more and more of horizontal leadership models, or, or other, there are even names like agile or other right. ways of doing and sharing information and working in groups. There is no, there is no more any linear hierarchical thing that can work in, in, in this situation, and that's very important because everyone is able to contribute. I'm asking myself a question. Does the idea of off-topic exist anymore? <sighs> Was that too tough? No. With so much creativeness, with so much potential, with so many different ways to go about solving a problem, adding value, creating revenue, whatever our goals are for the next five or 10 years, to have a business that continues to thrive and grow and change as the situation in the marketplace it's in thrives and grows and changes, we have too many things to consider. And so one of the things <laughs> that I really focus on is, it's great to explore something that I would consider off topic because it may not be if it helps shape and better define a problem. Yet going back to some of the other things you were saying about the spiral is a circle that's vertical. It makes me wonder if it's the right thing, not right now. And how do we discern as people that are, we're trying to innovate and create value and have something that has fast or quick impact, right? For the things that we need fast and quick impact for, as well as creating our future and having a place for what we're doing in the future. 
if those are at odds or not even in the same general direction, we end up getting stuck as companies. The important thing is that people have a very clear understanding of what the goals and the objectives of the company are. And that's exactly why we need for sustainability to become a really useful success and resilience strategy. We need to have it throughout all our processes, starting from the decision processes and the strategy settings of the company. And that's why what my other professor calls random acts of sustainability don't work. That's good, yeah. Someone calls them random acts or bolt-on sustainability initiatives. They don't work because that would be the off-topic, not the right moment that you mentioned. So that's why we need a very strong central axis of our spiral, which is the company has very clear objectives. They are strategically set. Sustainability and business objectives are very well connected. And then everybody in the organization know where they are going so that they naturally explore only those, so to say, off topics that are in a way connected to the central axis of the spiral. And that becomes a kind of productive brainstorming or exploring of different opportunities to achieve the goal that is clear for us, understood and shared. So we are back to it's a leadership thing. It is, and here's what I hear you saying, is that we need people to spend more time thinking about what that central access is so that everybody can go and explore, but it's still not everything that has to be explored. It's, yes, there's exactly. a filter. And by the way, I'm naturally this way. So I've got to call the kettle black a little bit right here. And that is they want to throw whatever idea comes up on the wall to see which one sticks so that they know which direction to move forward. And I'm changing. When people are coming to me with these ideas, I'm asking for a complete idea. I'm asking for a thought process around how does it tie to the goals of the Voice of Bold Business or one of the other projects under Red Direction and becoming more comfortable saying, that just doesn't fit here. Or this might work provided, here are the questions. How do we tie it back to our objectives? What is our concept of measurement to know that we're having success? How long do we think it's gonna to take to start seeing some results that we can measure success? And it's up to me. I actually think I'm the axis in red direction for the moment right now. So it's up to me to hold that space. And I know that with so many of us wearing so many hats, so many of us that we may or may not understand all the elements of the things that we're responsible for, that we have some leadership skills to develop. And one of them almost, I would say specifically is how do we leverage our time? Are we actually taking time to think, to create that access that you were describing so that people can go do the work that they want to do and be able to find those ideas and present them and get budgets for them and go execute them and implement them in an effective way. And what you are, what you are describing as what you do is exactly to keep people always well aware and remind the, them where, where you're going, what are the priorities and what are the things that are relevant in order to achieve the objectives. But you're also involving them. So you are not just denying them attention. You are asking them to think and to reflect. All right, but uh, please tell me how this is connected and how it would work and how it would help us achieve our objectives. And that's very important because you value the contribution of your people. You treat them as intelligent beings, which is something that's very much overlooked, in, especially in big organizations, unfortunately. So they are very much motivated in order to use their brains and their hearts, by the way, I'm sure. And their guts. We got three brains, brain, heart, gut, right? Yeah. Exactly. So there are three brains in order to bring up meaningful solutions that help achieve the objectives of the organization. I'm always astonished how 
the bigger the companies are, and multinationals are very special for this, the bigger they become, the more inefficient they become. And they have so many management systems in place in order to be efficient. But because of the fact that they don't engage people really into the meaningful objectives, mm -hmm. they are so inefficient. There is waste of time, energy, resources everywhere. So leadership is very important for this, for keeping yeah. to the axis. I was looking for a clip this morning, and I don't know how many Star Treks you have, where you're at, or how often you watch it. There's this new one called Star Trek Discovery, and it's in season two right now. And we just watched episode eight this last week. I say we, that's the royal we with me, me, myself, and I. It's a little guilty pleasure I have to catch up on a couple of TV shows in a week. And one of the clips is pertinent to what we're discussing because... There's this kerfuffle, right? Two guys have to work something out. Something happened between them, and it's going to be physical. Well, this whole thing gets done. The most senior person in the room allowed it to happen. And later on, the captain of the ship said, why did you allow that to happen? That is against the regulations and rules. And the captain came back, in, or the, the other gentleman that came back and said, there was nothing in our rule books, right? And I'm paraphrasing our rule books for this person that had that happen to them and this person that had that happen to them to handle it in a way that was documented. So I went with my gut and I think the bigger the organization, we rely on those, which is where the inefficiencies come in. Yet there's still a space for individuals to go. We got to go with our gut here in line with our heart and our head going, Ah, uh, there's nothing that I've encountered like this before. There's nothing that we've documented like this before. How would I feel? Can I empathize with how they are actually feeling? And then make that decision in the moment. Otherwise, that's why it's important to invest in people and to respect people, give them responsibilities and, and give them room to maneuver, to, to make their decisions, to make their mistakes. Yes. A constructive culture of mistake is very important in organization because living in denial of the fact that we all do mistakes but that we learn also by trial and error is so important in a way there has been this obsession especially in companies that are very very much attached to the quality certifications the non-conformity is the enemy, but sometimes that thrives on denial. So all the objectives is to conform to something. The real objectives are lost of sight. So it's important that people are allowed in a way to use the very important value of having a management system and to you know, be able to identify things that are not working in processes or opportunities for improvement. But on the other hand, they keep alive the discernment of what is really contributing to the real objectives yes. of the organization yes. and not just to match some paper. Oh, and that's, oh yes. My goodness, I've mentioned the paper. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you how I really just had an epiphany. Well, maybe it was an epiphany. It was definitely a light bulb. It was going back to what you were saying earlier. The axis if yeah. we were to use those management processes as the axis with which to not make everybody conform and do their work in, but as the mm -hmm. structure with which yeah. to go out and come back to, then it's a mental shift. Did I like, did I pick that up correctly? Absolutely. Okay. That's correct. That's All correct. Right. Huh. So there you go. I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought, but <laughs> it was like a whole body experience there. <laughs> 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 wonderful yeah, yeah yeah great so what That's makes it bold stuff. federico what makes it bold to incorporate sustainability as a leadership value makes it bold i think it is accepting that being a leader is first of all being the one who has visions and can generate new futures through the visions. It's having the courage to detach oneself from the icon of the competent manager 
and become the visionary leader who can also be wrong or who can also fail. But it's through these kind of visionaries that humanity has progressed. And luckily, I hope, it will continue to progress. You'll find all the program notes at voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P211. That's voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P211. You can also search for sustainability, a leadership value. And as our repeat guest, you can also search for Dr. Federico Fioretto and make sure and see all of the programs that he has been a part of on the Voice of Bold Business Radio. It's your turn to keep this conversation going. Use hashtag VBB radio, email us radio at reddirection.com and tell us your experiences with sustainability. Tell us how you as a leader and the leadership of your organization are incorporating the qualities of sustainability into everyday work to create a stronger tomorrow that is also adaptable to the situations that we find ourselves in. Now you've listened, you've watched Rate this program before you click on to the next one that you're going to listen to, before you go to the next task of your day, before you switch gears and enter a new situation. We're on iTunes, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and many others. Whatever your preferred listening and viewing platform is, stop by, give us a note, and we are glad to expand what it means to be a leader today because your voice is as important as our voices. That's what makes it bold. We are defining how to lead. I'd like to leave you with this. What are you doing to instill sustainability into your work? The Voice of Bold Business Radio gives you insights about how to achieve your company's growth strategy. When you aren't seeing the growth results you want, it's time to get an outside perspective. To discuss your specific situation around growth strategy, work with us. Visit voiceofboldbusiness.com and click Find Out More. Special thanks to the Scott Treatment for Technical Production. Thank you for joining us. Yes, can we use that segment um, at the end, like as a bonus? Yeah, of course. Okay, Scott, so when we're talking about the the case method that Federico created, that whole section, let's just throw as, as a bonus at the end after your closing. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's a rebellion I had when I developed the case method. Yeah. Before I developed it, I was completely opposed to any kind of structure and method. Then I took a training in healthcare communication with each. And then I learned a beautiful way to look at a structure. And they told me about the structure of the clinical conversation The structure is something that gives you freedom to explore all the clues that you wish to explore and having a safe way to come back and to be sure that you lose nothing that is important. So the structure gives you freedom to roam about. And then when I accepted to develop a method that's exactly a structured framework. So it's completely different. The structure that gives you freedom. And that made a click. I love it. 